All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Round and spring hopefully around the corner. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Ashton Chen from Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Dr. Chen trained at the Long Island Jewish Health System for her pediatrics and went on to the University of Michigan for her fellowship in nephrology. She has been with the Wake Forest System since that time and is currently an associate professor of pediatrics. Uh, Dr. Chen is uh, actively involved in the Transplantation Selection and Ethics Committee and has uh, co-authored and presented numerous times. Her chapters include uh, pediatric transplantation, nephritic and nephrotic syndromes in uh, children. Um, please welcome Dr. Chen. the opportunity to be here and speak to you today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'd like to speak about acute kidney injury and then also renal replacement therapy in children today. I have no disclosures. And I want to start off um, by just reviewing the objectives for today. So I want to define and classify acute kidney injury, and there's some um, new classification system in the last few years that have come out, so I wanted to go over that. Um, I also want to distinguish acute kidney injury from chronic kidney disease, so we'll define that today. And then I want to identify um, risk factors for acute kidney injury and also talk about how to evaluate causes for AKI. And then lastly, I'd like to go over the um, general indications for renal replacement therapy and briefly describe um, the different modalities that we have in renal replacement therapy. So I wanted to um, jump to a quick survey here. So if everyone can text um, Ashton Chen 063, if you have your phones with you, 237607, that'll allow you to join the group. And then you can respond to this question, which of the following is not an indication for dialysis? Um, A, uremia, B, rapidly rising creatinine, C, acidosis, D, hypernatremia, and E, hyperkalemia. Couple more here. Next question is, which of the following modalities of renal replacement therapy would be best for a four-year-old with influenza B, pneumococcal sepsis associated with acute kidney injury with severe volume overload? Just hit your little square box. Second here. Okay. Right, good. Back. And last one here. Um, the duration of Renal dysfunction that defines chronic kidney disease is A, seven days, B, six weeks, C, six months, D, three months, and E, two months. Okay, thank you for your responses. We're going to come back to these at the end here. Okay, so to start off, I want to define and classify acute kidney injury. 
Um, so the classic definition um, used to be uh, an abrupt decline in kidney function, um, but that's a pretty nonspecific definition. So the questions are, well, what change in creatinine is considered a significant decline? And then how do you define abrupt? So what's the time interval that this has to ha the creatinine has to change for it to be considered acute kidney injury? And this was the challenge, I think, that the community faced and, and was very difficult to do any research because nobody could agree on what acute kidney injury is. Um, so 2004 was an important year. Um, so that's where the Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative Group um, created the RIFLE criteria. Um, and they basically categorized different levels of acute kidney injury, R for risk, I for injury, F for failure, more severe cases, L for loss, or E and stage renal disease using um, absolute numbers of creatinine. This is not um, suitable for the pediatric population because as we know, there's no absolute um, normal creatinine for a child because it depends on their age and also depends on, on their gender. So in 2007, there was an important modification to the original rifle criteria, making it, um, making it applicable to the pediatric population. And that used a percentage change in creatinine rather than an absolute number. And it also included urine output as a measure of injury because um, urine output sometimes is the initial sign of acute kidney injury before there's a significant change in creatinine. And then in 2007, um, there was an additional um, criteria. It was expanded to include patients that had greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per deciliter increase in creatinine within a 48-hour period. This was uh, more pertaining to adult patients, but they found that um, the prior two classification systems excluded a certain portion of individuals that had acute kidney injury, and so this um, amendment or modification was included so that um, these patients would then be um, diagnosed with AKI. Um, but the current definition um, came from the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Initiative, and they had an acute kidney injury work group, and they um, basically blended the above criteria, the rifle, the pediatric rifle, and the acute kidney injury network criteria to develop um, kind of a blended classification system. And this has been validated in some of the recent studies that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And so um, I thought it was important just to include this. It's by no means meant to be memorized, um, but it's a nice reference. And so you can see that um, it includes both um, you know, an absolute number in the case here, but also um, a percentage, which is um, helpful for the pediatric population to define acute kidney injury, but also to classify it. So the greater the increase in creatinine from baseline, the, the more severe the staging of AKI. Um, they also included the initiation of renal replacement therapy um, as a way to define severe or stage three acute kidney injury. And then you can see on the right-hand column, um, the inclusion of urine output and the degree of um, oliguria or anuria and the length of time as also a measure to determine severity of acute kidney injury. So before we talk more about acute kidney injury, um, I do want to define chronic kidney disease and how it's different from acute kidney injury. Um, again, in 2012, um, the same group, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Initiative, um, tasked, there was a group that was tasked with defining chronic kidney disease. And they came up with um, either an abnormality of kidney structure or um, decrease in kidney function. Um, this has to be present for at least three months, and this abnormality has to have some implications for the individual's health. So what they mean by that is um, somebody may have a simple cyst that's found as an incidental finding on a kidney ultrasound. Um, this is a common finding both in children and adults. It's benign. It's not really associated with any um, poor health outcomes or progression to chronic kidney disease, and that would not be considered um, chronic kidney disease, although that is an abnormal kidney structure. Um, on the other hand, if you have a patient who has several family members with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, and as a child they have um, an ultrasound and you see lots of cysts in both kidneys, which is often the case, um, even at a young age with um, AD PKD, um, that would um, suggest that they probably have um, a pre predisposition to have chronic kidney disease later in life or even um, kidney failure. And so that would be, they would be classified as having chronic kidney disease even at that stage, even though their kidney function would be normal. So you have to have either decreased function or an abnormal kidney structure. Um, so the criteria, again, um, decreased renal function is commonly known, but they also added 
um, that any markers of kidney damage, and you can just have one, would categorize somebody as having chronic kidney disease. So either albuminuria, um, an abnormal urine sediment, such as cast in the urine, um, electrolyte abnormalities because of tubular dysfunction. Um, if they have histologic abnormalities on renal biopsy, they would have chronic kidney disease. Um, and then, again, structural abnormalities on um, imaging of the kidneys. And any patient that's had a kid history of kidney transplantation, even if their function is normal, is considered having chronic kidney disease. So the key takeaway points are that you can have um, not just abnormal function, but if you have abnormal kidney structure that has some implications for health in the long term, and you have the patient has this for um, three months or greater, then they have chronic kidney disease. Okay, so I want to shift back now to um, acute kidney injury and talk about the risk factors for it. Um, so I wanted to just cover some of the, um, briefly cover some of the more recent um, studies that have um, come forth since the classification system has been more clearly defined. Um, this is an important review article that was published in, the, in Pediatric Nephrology in 2017 looking at the epidemiology of acute kidney injury in children worldwide, so not just in the U.S. And this included developing countries as well. Um, they looked at both children in the um, intensive care unit, but also children outside the ICU setting. In the non-ICU setting, mortality was found to be higher in children with acute kidney injury and as high as 15% in some areas. Um, nephrotoxic medications were the most highly associated um, risk factor with acute kidney injury in this population. And of children who had no history of chronic kidney disease and were not um, intensive care patients, 5% um, of them had an episode of acute kidney injury during just a routine hospitalization, and this is not insignificant. And they also looked at um, the ICU setting and found that acute kidney injury rates have significantly increased um, about nine times from the 1980s to the last decade. Um, this is attributed to medical advances, improved um, survival after cardiac surgery, and just children with more complex um, chronic disease um, having greater survival now than previously. They found that, it, that AKI can occur in up to 25% of all PICU admissions, which is, which is high, and that there's progressively higher mortality with the increased severity of the acute kidney injury stage. And some of the factors that were associated with AKI in the ICU were um, a diagnosis of sepsis, previous cardiac surgery or bypass, um, the use of nephrotoxic medications, or exposure to contrast. And these were, again, worldwide. So this is a study um, from the New England Journal of Medicine, also published in 2017, just over a year ago, looking at, the, again, the epidemiology of acute kidney injury and critically ill children um, specifically, and also included some young adults. Um, this was a um, multinational prospective study that, that um, um, looked at, um, observed this over a three-month time period. And this included pediatric ICUs. I think it was close to 30 some pediatric ICUs in Asia, Australia, North America, and Europe. Um, and they found that um, the presence or the diagnosis of AKI increased mortality similar to the previous review article, um, that use of renal replacement therapy was the second strongest predictor of death in these patients after the use of vasopressor support. The, again, the more severe the stage of the acute kidney injury, there was an increased risk of death. And mortality was higher among patients that had um, decreased urine output as part of their diagnosis of AKI. They found that Predictors of AKI, um, so some of the factors that would increase risk were um, a history of transplantation. This is not just kidney transplantation. This is bone marrow and all solid organs. Um, if on admission to the ICU, the patient had a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, that also conferred a higher risk for AKI. And again, nephrotoxin use. So you can see some common themes already starting. Um, so why, why do we care about um, acute kidney injury? Um, well, certainly, it causes prolonged hospitalization, and that's associated with increased costs, which we're all conscious about nowadays. Um, but more importantly, I think, um, we know that having acute kidney injury in childhood can um, increase your risk of progression to chronic kidney disease later on and in, into adulthood. Um, so this is a study published by um, Dr. Stuart Goldstein in 2012, 
And there's really good data, of course, on, on pediatric cancer patients because they're entered into registries. And so um, he looked at this population and, um, you know, up to 50 to 70 percent of these children um, who had acute kidney injury developed chronic kidney disease. And this can manifest as just hypertension. Some of them had tubular disorders. Um, some had actually decreased glomerular filtration rate or decreased function, and others had proteinuria. Um, and these were these are patients that are exposed to nephrotoxic medications for their chemotherapy regimen, but also had frequent infections and were treated with nephrotoxic antibiotics and other medications. Um, so the last study I thought I wanted to include, because I think it's important, um, is um, a study that was um, published again in 2017, when a lot of this data came out, the busy year, um, in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics, um, there's, it was well known or is well known that in adult patients that receive um, vancomycin plus a beta-lactam agent, um, they have a higher risk of acute kidney injury. And so this group wanted to look at that in children to see if that was also true. And they found that um, in this particular study, they looked at um, exposure to piperacillin tazobactam as a beta-lactam agent. So patients, children that received both vancomycin and piperacillin tazo in combination, um, of, of almost 10 percent developed acute kidney injury. And I think what's significant is that um, close to 50 percent of them um, were, were classified as having stage 2 or greater um, acute kidney injury, so not, not necessarily mild. Um, those that received combination therapy and had acute kidney injury were often given um, two or more nephrotoxic agents or exposed to IV contrast, which is similar to some of the other studies we've looked at. Acute kidney injury um, in this study was associated with an increased hospital length of stay, again, similar to, this, to the previous um, study, and in, an increase in hospital mortality. Um, nobody really understands um, what the mechanism is, but there's some thought that the um, beta-lactam agent somehow increases the, vanco the potential for vancomycin nephrotoxicity, but the mechanism is, is still unknown. Um, but I think it's important because um, <coughs> in cases where you might be able to choose a different alternative or have that option, it may be better to choose something different. Um, and just being aware that if vancomycin and a beta-lactam agent is, um, is the only choice for a particular infection you're treating, just to be aware of this and, um, and really monitor closely for the development of acute kidney injury. So I'd like to um, move now to talk about causes for acute kidney injury. And I like to um, really think um, schematically about acute kidney injury and break it down um, into pre-renal, intrinsic renal, and post-renal causes. I think it's important because there's often more than one cause at any given time for acute kidney injury, and I think it's important to think about it this way so that you can really identify causes and that would help you hopefully in your management. And so pre-renal causes are anything that decreases your renal perfusion. So if you have hypovolemia, um, say in the, um, from dehydration, that can start, that's one of the more common ones. Um, peripheral vasodilation from sepsis can cause AKI. If you have circulatory failure, heart failure, if you have bilateral renal artery thrombosis, you're not perfusing either kidney and can develop um, acute kidney injury. Or if you have a single kidney and have um, renal artery thrombosis, um, the same can happen. Um, drugs, diuretics can um, exacerbate hypovolemia and lead to pre-renal AKI. And ACE inhibitors also through altered blood flow and decreased cardiac output can also contribute to acute kidney injury. And then hepatorenal syndrome, which is not seen often, but can, um, through altered blood flow in the setting of liver failure, cause um, pre-renal AKI. And so intrinsic renal um, is pretty much anything that affects the intrarenal blood flow um, or um, the tubular interstitial compartment of the kidney. So arterial um, causes, um, you can have embolic disease, hemolytic uremic syndrome, where you have direct um, vascular injury from the sugar toxin. Um, thrombosis um, decreases your venous outflow, and that can cause intrinsic renal injury. Of course, glomerular nephritis can cause AKI. Um, and then the more common one I think we see in the hospital setting is ATN or acute tubular necrosis. That's common <laughs> due to prolonged pre-renal insult, so when you have decreased renal perfusion for an ongoing period, then you, the tubules um, 
develop injury and necrosis, and that um, leads to ATN. You can also have direct tubular injury from nephrotoxin exposure, which we've talked about in some of these studies. And then you can have an obstructed obstruction, um, tubular obstruction from crystal formation, and that's most commonly seen with acyclovir. And then tubular interstitial disease mainly includes pyelonephritis, um, which I think we sometimes overlook, even though it's something we look for often, especially when patients present with fever. Um, in itself, it can cause AKI and allergic interstitial nephritis as well. And post-renal is pretty much anything that, that obstructs your urine outflow from the kidney. So this can be higher up in the urinary tract. You can have obstruction, um, unilateral ureteral obstruction in the setting of solitary kidney and have AKI. You can have bilateral ureteral obstruction, which is not seen often, but sometimes happens when you have such as bilateral stones or you have a large intra-abdominal mass that can cause bilateral obstruction. Um, urethral obstruction, which is lower in the urinary tract from posterior urethral valves, or again, you can have a stone that's passed through, but somehow obstructs um, at the lower urinary tract at the level of the urethra. And then neurogenic bladder um, is pretty straightforward, but where you, when you're not able to empty or void, that can lead to with renal AKI. I wanted to like to talk about each of these a little bit more in detail. So um, if you think pre-renal causes might be the issue, it's important to really assess not only for ongoing hypotension, which would lead to decreased renal perfusion, but if the patient's had a prior um, hypotensive episode, if they've had a cardiac arrest, um, you know, even children that have surgery or in the OR, you know, looking at those, um, that time period is important because the patient, things may have changed and they may not actually be hypotensive now, but maybe had this event previously. Also looking at the serum albumin, is their serum albumin low? And that decreases your oncotic pressure. So you have decreased intravascular volume, and that leads to decreased perfusion, and that's something that can be corrected very easily. Also, what's the cardiac function? Does the patient have a known cardiac dysfunction or cardiac disease, or is it something that you need to screen for um, as a possible cause? And then, of course, severe anemia, especially in setting up blood loss, can lead to um, pre-renal AKI. Um, evaluating for intrinsic causes, um, urinalysis is probably the, the most helpful, looking for um, hematuria, proteinuria, um, also leukocytes, leukocyte esterase nitrates in the setting of um, a UTI. Um, if you can do urine microscopy, that's helpful in identifying, um, say, red cell cast that would go along with nephritis. Um, or white blood cells or white blood cell cast that can be seen also with um, infection, but also interstitial nephritis. Urine culture, of course. Urine eosinophils is a tool used to diagnose interstitial nephritis. On its own, it's not really that helpful, but can be um, an additional tool used. And then complement can be helpful in diagnosing nephritis or classifying nephritis in terms of what, what needs to be done to treat it. And then drug levels are probably um, um, the most helpful, especially when you think there's been nephrotoxin exposure. I always encourage um, my colleagues to get drug levels. Even if the patient was previously on a nephrotoxic agent and is not currently on, sometimes the drug levels can persist at high levels for a while and, ha and cause ongoing kidney injury. So checking gentamicin, vancomycin, methotrexate levels um, can be helpful um, in, in diagnosing this. And then, of course, kidney biopsy sometimes is necessary if the diagnosis is not clear or to um, de determine what type of nephritis the patient has to determine treatment. And then post-renal evaluation is pretty straightforward. Renal ultrasound is probably the best tool to assess for this or a bladder scan at the bedside to look for bladder um, distension. If the patient's not making urine and their bladder's full, that should um, clue you into maybe post-renal AKI. And then you can always, um, if unsure, place a Foley or do catheterization to see if decompressing the bladder um, leads to improvement in function. So these are some of the diagnostic tools um, that are helpful in acute kidney So using the serum creatinine to calculate the glomerular filtration rate or the renal function, um, using the Schwartz formula, that's a more commonly used formula, and that's available on many online calculators. Um, it assigns a constant, which is the K, to the patient based on their age and their gender. And then if you have their height divided by their serum creatinine multiplied by that constant, that gives you their glomerular filtration rate. 
This is helpful in classifying um, degree of AKI, but also it's important in redosing antibiotics or other medications that need to be adjusted in the setting of um, AKI. And then assessing urine output, um, you know, do they have oliguria? Is their urine output less than 300 cc's per meter squared per day or less than 0.5 cc's per kilo per hour? Um, in infants, it would need to be less than one cc per kilo per hour to be considered oliguric. And then um, the fractional excretion of sodium, does anyone use that here in trying to define the cause of AKI? So, uh, on its own, it's probably not um, the only thing you should rely on, rely on, but sometimes it's a helpful tool if um, you're not sure if it's more pre-renal or intrinsic renal. Um, and so I included the formula here. Um, if, if your FENA is less than 1%, it would point more towards pre-renal causes. If it's greater than 2, um, more likely intrinsic renal or ATN. If it's in between, um, it's not really helpful. And then um, the challenge with the FENA is that most, a lot of patients that have decreased urine output with acute kidney injury are on diuretics or have received diuretics, and that can alter um, the renal sodium excretion and affect the FENA. So in those cases, you can use a fractional excretion of urea, um, and that also may be helpful. It's calculated similarly. If it's um, greater than 20, 30%, it would, um, excuse me, less than 20 to 30%, it would go along with pre-renal causes, and if it's closer to 50, um, to 60 percent, uh, more likely ATN. These are not exact um, tools, but they can help you as you're trying to sort things out. I included the BUN creatinine ratio. I don't use this really, um, but I, I thought it would be important to mention. Um, in children, I think it's um, not very reliable because there are many things that can, can affect your blood urea nitrogen, catabolism, um, malnutrition, especially in a patient that's been hospitalized for a long time. Um, but I did want to mention that if, if in an otherwise healthy individual, they you know, come enter the hospital and their ratio is greater than 20 to 1, it would suggest more pre-renal. If it's closer to 10 to 15 to 1, more ETN. If it's less than 5 to 1, I really don't think it's that helpful, but it could um, signify liver disease or malnutrition, but really doesn't help you in terms of defining the cause of AKI. Um, so management. Um, we talked a little bit about this previously, but for pre-renal causes, of course, hydration if there's volume depletion. If you've identified the serum albumin as being low, and I usually, um, if it's less than 2.7 in the setting of acute kidney injury, I would think about replacement with 25% albumin. It's often helpful to do that before you give the diuretic, so you pull the fluid into the intravascular compartment with your um, albumin increasing the oncotic pressure and then follow with a diuretic that can help um, sometimes with the diuresis better than the diuretic alone. Um, of course, transfusion, if there's severe anemia, um, if there's hypotension, sometimes starting a presser, particularly dopamine, because it increases renal perfusion, can be helpful. And then I think use of diuretics. In some settings, it's helpful, but if there's volume depletion, you want to be careful um, to not do that until after you restore volume, because you can exacerbate the acute kidney injury. So I wanted to just briefly talk about intrinsic renal um, management. A lot of it's supportive, so ATN really um, just has to take time to recover on its own. Um, in the meantime, diuretics are helpful to maintain your urine output. If you're able to choose an alternative antibiotic that's not nephrotoxin, if that's the cause, um, again, that's helpful, or at least following drug levels um, extra closely, even daily. Sometimes we, instead of changing the interval of, say, vancomycin, we actually will check a level and then dose it once we have the level back to ensure that we're not giving a dose when the level is too high. Um, and then, of course, renal dosing antibiotics. Um, it's important, especially with nephrotoxic antibiotics, but in general, if they have AKI, you need to um, renal dose all medications, including antibiotics. Interstitial nephritis, um, withdrawing the offending agent, is the mainstay of treatment. In severe cases, sometimes steroids are used. Islandophytis, of course, antibiotic therapy. If they have an indwelling Foley catheter, it's important to change that um, to remove the nidus of infection. In um, acute glomerular nephritis, if they have post-infectious, which is the most common, um, it's generally supportive care. They recover on their own. Um, they do need often diuretics because they tend, these patients tend to retain salt and water because of the um, inflammation in the kidney. The diuretics are helpful in controlling blood pressure and uh, maintaining urine output. 
And if it's something other than or suspect um, something other than post-infectious post nephritis, then um, a biopsy would be indicated. Um, vascular causes hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, really just supportive. Um, there's some thought that early dialysis may be helpful to remove the toxin itself and ongoing injury. Although most of these patients I found present pretty late in the course, um, and um, it may not be that helpful at that time, so dialysis would only be indicated if there was other reasons. And then um, ankle vasculitis, um, plasmapheresis, dialysis, and um, aggressive immunosuppression. And then if there's thrombosis, of course, the best outcomes are with early anticoagulation if it's successful. And then post-renal management, um, pretty much treating the urinary retention with a Foley placement or intermittent straight catheterizations. And um, if you suspect posterior urethral valves, um, urology is usually involved um, pretty early on. So other considerations for management, generally speaking, with AKI is to really monitor strict intake and output. Um, I think it's important to assess the patient's um, hydration status, but also um, every, the renal function in the urine output can, can constantly be changing or fluctuating. It's important, important to continue to assess that so that you're not underhydrating, but also you're not overhydrating if the um, AKI is worsening because that can lead to volume overload and respiratory issues. Um, of course, you mentioned renal dosing of all medications, and that needs to be done on a regular basis, so probably checking creatinine even once or twice a day, um, and then constantly adjusting your dosing based on your um, calculated glomerular filtration rate. Um, dietary restrictions are important to control electrolytes. This can be key in preventing the need for renal replacement therapy for um, hyperkalemia or electrolyte derangements if you can control them with um, dietary restrictions. Um, Fluid restriction is important if there's oliguria or anuria um, to prevent volume, further volume overload. And I recommend um, calculating the insensible losses for the patient and adding whatever urine output um, to that to calculate their fluid rate. Um, 500 cc's per meter squared per day is a calculation for insensible losses. Um, in cases where you don't know the patient's height and you can't calculate the body surface area, that may be difficult. So a shortcut would be to take a third of the maintenance fluid rate for an older child or adolescent or a quarter of the maintenance rate for an infant or young child. Um, that's a, a nice shortcut, and usually it's pretty accurate. Um, and then I, you have to have ongoing assessment for indications for renal replacement therapy, which we'll talk about next. So I went through fellowship and never heard the AEIOU mnemonic, but the genetics, the geneticist that I um, work with taught me that when I joined Wake Forest, so I've adopted that um, as I try to categorize um, indications for renal replacement therapy. So the A um, stands for hyperaminemia and acidosis as indications for dialysis, um, E, ethanol toxicity, electrolyte abnormalities, and those include um, hyperkalemia, both hypo and hypernatremia and hyperphosphatemia. Um, intoxications or ingestions um, is what the I stands for. O stands for fluid overload. And then U for uh, uremia um, or elevated BUN and hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia is not one that's often the sole indicator for dialysis, although it has come up um, with, with our group a couple times. Um, even outside of the oncology um, patient setting. And we actually developed a protocol using Respiracase um, for hyperuricemia in the setting of acute kidney injury, and we treated some patients successfully and um, prevented their need for dialysis. So it's just something to consider. So I'd like to shift now to talk about the different forms of renal replacement now that we know the indications. Um, and the different dialysis modalities we have are peritoneal dialysis, a hemodialysis and continuous renal replacement therapy, which is, I like to think of it as a continuous, more gentle form of hemodialysis. So PD or peritoneal dialysis, um, disadvantages are it's less efficient and less precise in correcting electrolytes. Um, it's less efficient in fluid removal. 
Um, but this is a potential advantage in hemodynamically unstable patients, particularly um, post-op cardiac patients, where it may be difficult to obtain vascular access or very hemodynamically unstable. This would be the advantage of peritoneal dialysis. Um, it's also more optimal if you think the patient is, is very likely to progress to chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. Um, this is a therapy that can be done at home in the outpatient setting, so again, another advantage. Um, and it's technically more feasible in infants, um, again, where vas large vascular access may be difficult to obtain. Um, this is something that could be done more in the infant population. And so this um, just shows kind of how peritoneal dialysis works. So you have the peritoneal space. Um, it's a potential space in the abdomen lined by the peritoneal membrane that encases the intra-abdominal organs. Um, you infuse fluid from a dialysate bag, either um, manually with gravity and a stop clock system, or you can use um, a cycler in bigger kids where the machine actually um, pushes the fluid into the abdomen. Um, this is a dextrose containing fluid that sits in the peritoneal space. And then by diffusion, um, um, fluid and electrolytes and, and waste um, diffuses across the peritoneal membrane into the dialysate fluid. Over a period of time, equilibrium is achieved, and then um, this dialysate fluid with the waste and extra fluid is then removed um, by closing off the stop clock system to the dialysate bag, opening it to the waste bag, and through gravity, um, it drains out, or a machine, again, can be used, and that creates negative pressure and pulls the fluid out. And this cycle is repeated over and over again. And the frequency and how many cycles really just depends on the patient and what their needs are at that time. Hemodialysis um, is kind of a shotgun rapid um, clearance. So it's done within an hour, <coughs> three hours. So you have very rapid um, changes in solute, plasma solute composition and electrolytes. And you have very rapid removal of fluid if you, um, if you need it. Um, but this can also result in um, a lot more hemodynamic instability. So it's not really appropriate for an unstable patient, particularly in the ICU setting. Um, because there's a high risk of hypotension and dysrhythmia, and this can be, um, this is not ideal in somebody who's on pressors and, and very unstable and sick in the ICU. Um, on the other hand, it is very good for rapid removal of toxin or nephrotoxic agent. If there's high um, methotrexate levels and you're not able to clear it, it can remove that very quickly. Um, and ingestions, it can be helpful because the patient may be otherwise stable, but the goal is just to remove the toxin. Hemodialysis would be the way to go. And then continuous renal replacement <coughs> therapy, um, again, is a more continuous, gentle form of hemodialysis done through similar access of hemodialysis. Um, advantages, it can be done um, in line with ECMO. Um, so if a patient's sick and they're on ECMO, um, this kind of filter system can really just be plugged into the ECMO circuit dialysis. Um, there is um, more gentle and very precise removal of fluid, um, so it could be used in unstable patients in the ICU setting. It gives you very good um, tight metabolic control and electrolyte control because you can change the dialysis fluid and, and customize it to really whatever you want to achieve for the patient. We had a patient recently who um, really they were targeting very high sodium levels because of cerebral edema and um, um, a increased ICP, and there was concern that he might herniate. And so they were really targeting sodiums of like 150, and that's very hard to do, but with um, continuous renal replacement therapy, you can use dialysis fluid that um, has high sodium levels to achieve that. So that would be a, a potential use for, um, or advantage to CRT. Um, there's also the added benefit of enhanced removal of cytokines, so that is advantageous in sepsis or in the setting of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, where you have cytokine removal that's leading to um, instability and, and um, um, exacerbating the illness. So this can be a little bit technical, but I did want to just talk about um, the different types of CRT or what can be done with CRT, because um, there is some um, different types of um, solute removal that can be done depending on the machine you have and how you program it. So you can have just ultrafiltration, so simple, just fluid removal. You can remove um, solute by convection. You can also remove solute by diffusion, and then and both if you choose to, depending on what your machine's capabilities are. Um, so ultrafiltration, just briefly, um, blood flows um, across the dialysis filter here. 
there's a pressure cre gradient created, and then um, fluid just moves across um, the semi-permeable membrane and then can be pulled off. Um, this is how it would look. So blood flows through the um, catheter from the patient, goes across the dialysis filter, or CRRT filter, um, and then, um, again, the pressure gradient is created, <coughs> it moves across this membrane, and then the blood is returned to the patient. Another form of um, site removal is convective clearance. And I like to think of this as the coffee filter. So um, just as in um, you have the coffee grinds and you, have, you put water through a filter, on the other side, you don't just get your water back, you get um, flavor and color molecules from the coffee grinds. So similarly, you um, have blood flowing from a pump across this filter here, um, and um, basically you add fluid here, and then on the other side you get um, some of the fluid back, but also some solutes. And again here, blood flows through the dialysis catheter from the patient and goes to through this filter. You're adding in this water to the coffee filter or the filter replacement fluid. You go across the filter and it pulls off the ultrafiltrate plus some of the solute here, and then the blood is returned to the patient. And then lastly, diffusion is um, pretty much unwanted solutes, which are more concentrated in the patient's blood, diffuse across this membrane um, from higher to lower concentration through diffusion. And um, again, how that looks is blood flows from the patient across the filter. You add in a dialysis fluid here, which doesn't actually mix with the blood, but creates a countercurrent um, flow here. And then it pulls off the ultrafiltrate and dialysate um, solution uh, as waste, and that's the solute moves from higher concentration to lower across this membrane, and then the blood is returned to the patient. And so different modalities of CRT are used depending on the clinical scenario, and again, this just shows that you can kind of do all of the above uh, and then at one time if necessary. So your convective clearance, your coffee filter technique here, your um, hemodialysis here, pulling off ultrafiltrate and dialysate. So um, I wanted to go back to the questions. All right, there we go. Okay, so I wanted to go back to this question, um, which of the following is not an indication for dialysis? So A, uremia. If you haven't joined this group before, you just need to text my name, Ashton Chen, 063 to that number, and then you can join and then put in your answer. Good. Very nice. <laughs> All right, perfect. So let's go back. All right, so which of the following modalities of renal replacement therapy would be best for a four-year-old with influenza B, sepsis, and acute kidney injury with severe volume overload? The answer is C, um, continuous renal replacement therapy. This is a very unstable patient. You need to um, remove fluid and a more gentle um, form of dialysis and would be continuous renal replacement therapy compared to hemodialysis. Last question, the duration of renal dysfunction that defines chronic kidney disease is what time frame? 
I'm not sure why it's <coughs> but the answer is D, three months. Thank you for your responses. So um, to summarize, I hope that um, you can recognize better acute kidney injury and anticipate the um, clinical settings where patients may be at risk or um, at high risk for AKI. Um, hopefully you also know when would, when would be appropriate time to consult nephrology for management of acute kidney injury and hopes to reduce the need for renal replacement therapy because we've seen from the studies that um, reducing need for renal replacement therapy um, well, it's probably most important to prevent AKI, but if you have AKI, um, if you can reduce the need for dialysis, you decrease the patient's mortality risk. And then hopefully you can identify clinical scenarios where renal replacement therapy may be needed. So this is an electron uh, microscope photograph of a renal biopsy specimen from one of our patients um, at Wake Forest. Um, as a nephrologist, um, I, of course, value the kidneys. I think they're very important. Um, but I hope I've inspired you today to, to do your part and prevent um, kidney injury and protect and preserve kidney function. So there is a heart in the kidney. So, you see there. Um, so if you do this, the, the kidneys will thank you. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. All right, I'll start at the front here. Better be a good one after that. <laughs> uh, Mont, probably not so good, but more as an intern question. Mm -hmm. uh, for CMP, why is, with Swartz equation being a constant, why is uh, uh, GFR not included in it for children? On, on our CMP, it always says unable to calculate for, oh, all, so, uh, for anyone under 18. So they're, um, are you using an online calculator or? No, I'm just, you just order a complete metabolic panel, and at the very bottom, it has oh, GFR. Yeah, I don't rely on those. I'm not actually calculated. sure how those are calculated. We, our lab does the same, and it says the same. I'm not sure how that. Um, but for the adult population, it does calculate. Yes, yes. yeah, and it does, at least ours distinguishes also African-Americans mm -hmm. because they yes. have higher um, creatinine, so lower GFR compared to um, non-African-American patients. But I, I always recommend using the online calculators um, not, not a plug for Cornell, but there's a, um, a nice um, calculator because they have the modified and the original Schwartz, and that depends on your crayon and assay, which I don't know for your lab, um, but that's a very nice calculator. And so I usually just plug in, um, I use that myself, just plug in the patient's height if you have it and their crayon, and it will give you their GFR. Great question. Right, and I think that's right. because it's, done off of a body surface area, and, and most of those will not calculate that from your patient when you're doing it through the lab that way. Um, but my question actually feeds off of your Schwartz question. So I'm a mm -hmm. pediatric oncologist, mm -hmm. and the paper by Goldstein was very informative, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was wondering, that's a very high degree of, a, mm -hmm. uh, well, of chronic kidney disease mm -hmm. in adult survivors, and most of our survivor data doesn't look as um, impressive as that. Right. Um, so I was wondering twofold. Two things. One, what degree of AKI did those patients have? Did he cut it off at some level, like it had to be AKI two or three before he would actually do that, or did he look at just stage one AKI as well? That's one thing. And the second thing is the Schwartz formula obviously is a gross estimation, and I know that some groups are actually looking at trying to use um, imaging modalities like MRI to actually calculate nephron mass mm -hmm. uh, and then to look at decrease in nephron mass as you go, which would be a much better indication of when you should stop something, consider a different type of therapy. would like for you to comment on both of those. Um, yeah, great question. So, um, so the study, I think the challenge is that we really didn't have a classification system for acute kidney injury that was appropriate for pediatrics and, you know, until 2007. So a lot of that data is old, older data. Um, and I, I think, I'd like to think that we're doing a better job of recognizing AKI or preventing it. Um, I know we're actively involved in a lot of the um, oncology patients at our center. Um, so I don't, I don't think we even have the data for the, the stage of AKI that they experienced. Um, and I, I think um, it's probably the best data we have, but I don't think it's all that good because it's so far um, from when the patients were treated and it's a retrospective study. Um, and there's probably other factors that that were not controlled for. Certainly, history of prematurity increases your risk for chronic kidney disease apart from 
um, you know, having um, an oncologic disorder. Um, but that's an ex excellent point. And I, th I hope that now that we have a classification system, we can get better data um, going forward. And as you can see, after the classification system came about, you know, even last year, we've had the most studies published in pediatric AKI. Um, your second question was, remind me again, your second question, the, renal mass. Uh, right, I think, um, yeah, the, the creatinine in itself is not a great measure of renal function. Um, I, I don't know, um, we, we haven't used, um, I don't have any personal experience using um, MRI for renal mass. I know that that's been talked about. Another thing that's been talked about is cystatin C, which is another marker of kidney function. The challenge is that, at least in our lab, is it's a send out, so you may not get it back for 10 days or 14 days, and so in, in real time, that's not helpful. But I think um, some of these other um, measures of renal function may, may be helpful. Um, I think, you know, renal mass, I think that those type of things would be really helpful more in maybe in chronic kidney disease setting. Or another challenge we have is what kidney function is, um, like when listing children for transplant, it's constantly changing. and. Sometimes they meet criteria for transplant, and then the next week you get labs and they go. And, and um, I think that might be a, a good scenario. I think in the inpatient setting, it may be a little challenging to do imaging and sort of calculate that on a day-to-day -day basis where the creatinine or the renal function may be shifting. But I, I agree with you. I think that some of these new methods will be um, helpful and hopefully in the long run better than um, the creatinine can offer us. Great question. Any other questions or comments in the room? I can unmute the phone since we have a few minutes. Stand by. Just kidding. Hang on. Any questions? I can uh, unmute the phones. We have about uh, two minutes. So if you do not want to make a comment or ask a question, just please put your phone on mute now. The conference is now in talk mode. Does anyone on the line have a question for Dr. Chen? Yeah, this is Michael Hart, Alex. So just a quick question. What do you personally use as, as your um, rapid marker of recovery after injury? What do you like to follow and sort of give you a good prognostic value uh, for the parameters that you like to say this is a positive sign? Um, so in the recovery period, I always think that um, increased urine output and, and even polyuria is a sign of early tubular recovery and uh, kidney recovery. And that usually precedes improvement in um, creatinine. And I think that you, the BUN, again, there's other factors that usually follows um, through the improvement in creatinine. But that's kind of the, um, I guess, the signs that we look for. Um, but it can be different depending on what the cause of the injury is and also um, how long the injury has um, occurred. Great question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Anyone else on the line have a question or want to make a comment? Dr. Reynolds told me I had to give him eight seconds. She gave me very strict instructions. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.